So I did it. And then it was just like so successful immediately that it yeah. kind of was like, is this what dealing drugs feels like? Like <laughs> I, I've never made this much money from doing this little yeah. work in my entire life. And so that was then a huge factor in being like, okay, this is really nice. The stigma was bad and I have faced a lot of bad consequences for it. But like once I was in it and I was able to actually like live a life where I have time, it was amazing. Welcome to Queer Talk, the number one podcast to connect you to all of your favorite queer creators in a space where we share our stories on all things queer related. And hey, if you're new, listen to this, give us a follow on Spotify and subscribe on Apple Podcasts. We are now streaming full video episodes, guys, on YouTube. So if you guys, wherever you're watching, TV, phone, tab, tablets, um, be sure to hit that subscribe link. Uh, link to watch is in the description below. Today, our guest is a TikToker, a sex worker, and a mental health advocate. You can find her at XXX Summer Breeze. Please welcome Summer Breeze. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. I'm so excited in a pandemic world. This is like like a little outing for me. I know, right? This is literally, this is one of the reasons why I started the podcast was because I was like, holy shit, like I'm getting this following on TikTok. I feel like it would be fun to meet other creators and for like their followers to see them on longer form content. I was like, it's a win, win, win for everybody. (laughs) And it's just like nice community for a little bit. It really is. I've met so many cool queer people and I got a job. From one person that was just like, you just never know what the fuck is going to happen, which I think is really neat. That's so sick. Yeah. Yeah, I just like stalk you so hard. (laughs) I saw you liking all of my videos and I was like, oh yeah, she's doing the, the amount of stalking that I've done. (laughs) I love the, um, the sad gifted kid, uh, burnout. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of my therapy has been about that. So Yeah, it was really funny because like I'll see and like I posted it to Reels and it's also taking off on Reels and people are like, this is this whiny bitch, like this stupid, (laughs) like this stupid girl, like this sounds like everybody and like, just like being like, oh, whine, whine about you being gifted. And I'm like, that's not it at all, but it's all right. You can project. They're always going to say the word. There's like what I have found with the internet is that like people will have every possible bad opinion there is to have. Oh, and yeah. they're just, that's just going to be them. And that's what they're choosing to believe. And they will tell you. And you just got to ignore it and be like, the right people will find this. Yeah. Honest to God, I love when people just are overtly, like if they're overtly homophobic or they overtly mm-hmm. don't like me, I'm like, okay, at least you said it with your chest. Yeah. But like, but it's the petty shit. It's like, your hair looks like shit. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just got it done. But like, all right that's really mean I hate it when it's like I'm making something that is so obviously just like a joke for laughs and not like a Republican man joke where it's actually Mm -hmm. very offensive like like truly just like I'm trying to make my friends laugh I made myself laugh with this somebody comments with like a discourse essay paragraph like analyzing all my shit and I'm just like it wasn't that deep it's never that (laughs) it's never that those are my favorite because like those people literally have there's character limits so they're they're literally like okay i oh that's not gonna send so i gotta copy then i gotta go to my notes then i gotta redo it and then i gotta paste it in in replies like Mm -hmm. like the amount of time i'm like wow that definitely took a lot of time to cultivate that sucks that i'm just gonna block you (laughs) just like wow they cared so much and i care so so much less you have to not care. I mean, it's hard, especially when you like get a following so quickly and you're just like, oh, I went from like literally just people from my college seeing this to now like there's so many strangers. Like it's hard to navigate it. But yeah, I quickly learned like you just have to simply be Beyonce. Beyonce does not interact. She's yeah. above. She really is, which is super, super fun and cool. Super, super. I literally... I had followed you um, like a while back, but then I went to your Instagram and I was like, this chick is fucking, this is awesome. Like, look at all of this. Look, like your memes are on point. Thank you. I mean, it's been a weird year for me creatively. Honestly, I think the pandemic was just like so much on creative. So like I had bursts of like hyper creativity and I'm making like amazing shit. And then I would go like months at a time where I didn't post a single thing. So yeah, thank you. I do. I love making memes. Um, I honestly think I might like TikTok better than Instagram. Yeah. I might be willing to like make a little switcheroo. Um, 
but I did focus on Instagram for a really long time and I built a really awesome community there of queer people and um yeah people who have trauma (laughs) I think we all just kind of like are like little magnets to like find each other and we just like bond through that um and it's been really cool because I have like I mean I'm trying to be a little I'm trying to pick and choose what I disclose I used to just like dump my entire personal life online um but it has been nice because like as I have been going through my healing journey I have like been able to change the content and the memes. And I feel like a lot of people have been able to kind of see me grow, which is a cool social media phenomenon that I'm happy to be part of. It is hard to meet a queer person that hasn't had some form of trauma. Like I find it like, it's like a, it's a rare find. It's like a fucking unicorn. Like they're unicorns. No, I actually, yeah, I recently have been been hanging out with this guy and he is, he's queer, but he literally like grew up in a commune and has no trauma. And it's like hard to even like, like he just, everything about him, like kind of just like blows my mind. And I'm just like, I don't know if we can really like relate to each other because (laughs) it's like, he was saying like, yeah, I basically had like 30 parents and they were all amazing. And I was like, I basically had like none and they all sucked <laughs> 0.5 parents uh yeah. 0.5 parents and then all their shitty friends that I had to spend time around like yeah good stuff I feel um, like that sucks too because then it's like that's that's the pinnacle are we ever gonna reach that and then, then you just see where where you're falling and then you're like fuck that guy that guy fucking sucks I hate him I have found that like <laughs> the people I do get along with best and it's good. I It's hard with dating and queer dating because mm-hmm. like you can find yourself extremely drawn to somebody and you guys hit it off immediately. And it's because you can relate so much with your trauma, but that ends up being like the ultimate downfall of your relationship because both of you truly should not be dating right now. You should be in therapy. Yeah. Um, it's not a trauma bond. It's a bond of trauma. That's the difference. Yeah. Trauma bond is like the people you <laughs> got fucked up with. So like yep. me and my si- me and my siblings are like the most beautiful trauma bond. Like love that for us. Um, and then all my friends, yeah. As we're talking, we'll find like, wow, we really had similar. Yeah. Up- um, and it's really it's nice to know you're not alone, you know. But it's also like a challenge because both of you are gonna probably have communication issues. Both of you are going to have self-worth issues. Like Mm -hmm. I think the whole queer community would be so, so much better off in all of our dating and all of our friendships in like even online discourse if we all truly took the time and had the resources to like to love ourselves because Mm -hmm. like arguing online like about stuff that is, you know, it's queer infighting and it's just displaced anger. And it's like, you're mad at your parents you're not mad at me a stranger online like let's let's unpack this um and then come and regroup once we once we've learned I think it is it is really interesting to see people and you know like and I don't think I've ever said I've never just had that been like oh I'm gonna send like something shitty it just never I've never had that you know I've definitely been like a warrior where someone gets fucking you know like shit on and I'm like fuck I'm I'm going into action I'm activated ah um yeah. and then I end up picking the wrong side and then shit happens because I'm like emotional about it and I'm like oh sorry I, there was literally one one there was like a recent thing that happened and I literally there was a I had a miscommunication with this person this queer person I didn't know that they were queer I thought they were on the other side and and so I completely misread and then she literally or um uh they messaged me on on Instagram and they were like hey I'm so sorry. I think we were on the same page. I was like, yeah, I think we're on the same page too. I just got super hyped and I'm so sorry. And now we're friends. Love that. That's what we need more of, I think. And and I do see it happening like more often than not, which is just like recognizing that like, yo, all of us have similar experiences, which make us like very (laughs) reactive, very quick to upset like our, our feelings are just so intense. And so I think we just need a policy of like, Obviously, there should be accountability. I'm not saying there shouldn't be accountability, but like everyone, I think, is able to change. Everyone makes mistakes. We're all yeah. constantly yeah. making the exact same mistakes as each other. Like we just need more of a like, oh, yo, my bad, sorry. Like yeah. that's yes. 
And that's the thing, like it is hard when you're, and it's just communication over text in general. Okay. Like it can be so like, you can completely miss the point. And especially if you're like emotional about something. And that's not something I was usually able to do, but like with my platform, I'm like, okay, I need to use this. Like there's things that are happening. I'm going to make sure that I hold creators accountable because I am a creator. Even I'm a small one, I pack a fucking punch and I'm going to use it. And I'm going to make sure that shit doesn't happen. Big brother, let's go. Um, I just got to rem- I just got to pick the right side. <laughs> yeah, you need to. It's like all about nuance and research. I feel like online, though, it can be so easy, especially when you're like gunning for your friends, because then you're just like, I don't really care. Yeah. I'm just yeah. I'm the like their attack dog. You know, I've definitely yeah. been. There. I got you. I'm, yeah, okay. I have. Here's my I'm, wing. You're under my wing. Exactly. I have gotten myself into arguments that like weren't even mine. I was just defending my friend. And then later yeah. I was like, Summer, you need to um, just maybe calm it down a little bit. I'm trying to be less reactive and I'm trying to like, at least every time I respond to something, I want to be in a, like a calm place when I do yeah. that. Because otherwise, like, who knows what we'll say. Gays are notorious for being like really funny, but really mean at the same time. Oh, or- yeah. Or like saying something, saying something that like is a backhanded compliment. I was just, oh, I wasn't just talking. I was on a first date with someone and they were talking about their gay best friend. And, and she was saying, you know, like, you know, she, she's not like, you know, all into fashion and stuff like that. And, you know, she was just in like comfy clothes or whatever. And he walks in and he goes, oh, so you're going to be comfortable today. You know what I mean? And she was like, oh my God. And I was like, see, it's making comfortability and making it mean. Like you just- <laughs> yeah, I feel like a lot of times we're so used to external validation as well and using our humor as our coping mechanism and our like our armor that sometimes, at least I have found that I have like not been able to see that like just because something's funny doesn't mean it's not me. And like, yeah. just because yeah. something is like totally- it's smart, it's witty, it's hilarious. Yeah. Doesn't mean it's necessarily the right thing to say at yeah. that time yeah. to that person. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're growing, we're learning. It's it's weird to learn online uh, with an audience, but it definitely is like trial by fire. Oh yeah, 100%. And I feel like that's a good segue into this. I wanted to know a little bit about your background and how you got yeah. into sex work. Like, because I feel like the online community and, and I'll probably ask this question later, but like you, you get to see people in some of their most vulnerable states, which I find really fascinating. Like you probably like your clientele gets met. Like, I'm sure you get messages from your clientele that like they wouldn't even say to like their, their husband, wife, partner. And I find that super fascinating. I feel like like sex work industries and, and sex workers get to see people, their deepest, darkest desires and, and fantasies and stuff like that. Like, tell me a little bit about that because that's super fascinating. Of course. Um, so I, <laughs> and I hate that like there's so much stigma around sex work in society that like yeah. that always is a factor. If it wasn't a factor, like, I mean, I, I love it. You, the first time I ever watched lesbian porn, yeah, which was like before I even came out to anyone, right? Like it's- Of course. L word, the L word is the gateway drug. So I was in college wow. freshman year like, watching the L word in my quad, hoping my roommates didn't know what I was watching. Like, oh my yeah. God. And then I was like, okay, I see that they're hooking up, but like, there's a lot of fade to blacks here. And I think mm-hmm. I need some further instruction on like what, they, <laughs> what exactly they're doing. Yeah. So of course- I go online um, and I remember and like this, the lesbian porn uh, of, you know, the industry and years past was definitely very like male gaze centered, oh, but like course. same time, it was so like, whoa. Yeah. Those girls are getting paid to hook up and I'm mm-hmm. sure they're having literally so much fun yeah. because it's gay and hot. And I was like, always like, that'd be sick. That'd be such a sick job. So it was kind of always in the back of my mind, just like, you know, burnout gifted kid, like it's hard to break into an industry where there's so much stigma, um, unless kind of your back is against the wall. And like, I wish we lived in a world where everybody in sex work could be like, I'm doing this because I love it. Um, Mm -hmm. and I'm doing it exactly how I want to, because I love it. But like, 
the reality is like, I mean, so many people joined OnlyFans because of the pandemic. I was lucky. I joined right before the pandemic, like a That's month. Good. Yeah. Um, because, but again, like I joined, I had always thought about it, but then like there was a month where um, I went to Vegas. I got flown there because I was making memes for the sex toy company. It was dope. And while I was in Vegas, I, uh, I meant to be a sugar daddy, but I don't have the funds. And so I yeah. went out to a gay bar and I was just buying everybody drinks. And I was just like, this is amazing. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, I'm not going to make my rent. What am I going to do? So I was like, you know what? Now's the time. I'm dropping the MF okay. only fans. Okay. Uh, so I did it. And then it was just like so successful immediately that it yeah. kind of I was like, is this what dealing drugs feels like? Like <laughs> I. <laughs> I've never made this much money from doing this little yeah, work in yeah. my entire life. And so that was then like a huge factor in being like, okay, this is really nice. The stigma was bad and I have faced a lot of bad consequences for it. But like once I was in it and I was able to actually like live a life where I have time to actually like fix my mental health, make content, like it was amazing. And yeah, I definitely have found that it's really rewarding, especially with OnlyFans. Not that I would never do paid scenes. Like I'm super down, yeah, yeah. especially at this point in the economy. But like yeah. I got to make the porn that I wished existed when I was coming into my sexuality. Like what were the things that I was like frantically Googling, like trying to find this thing, you know? Like I don't want this like weird, a man is telling these girls what to do, like whole thing and it's not even like real gay sex like how people actually do it and there's not a lot of intimacy there and so I've gotten to like meet a bunch of people and hook up with a bunch of people that like I don't think I would have we would have made that connection yeah and we ended up having like a beautiful connection and there's also like as a queer who used to date with a lot of trauma and date a lot of people with a lot of trauma, it would suck because my sex life was so intricately tied with yeah. relationships that I'm not very good at. <laughs> like I'm not good yeah. at you need help. So with OnlyFans, it's like there's professional boundaries. It makes it so much easier to actually like have an existing stable relationship with somebody that is sexual and platonic and even maybe like intimate and romantic at points, but mm -hmm. it just explode like many relationships do. Um, yeah. so being a therapist, um, and there's so many things to talk about, but like yeah. my favorite messages that I get are from queer women who are like, I mean, some of them are stressful because some girls are literally like still dating men and they're like in oh, my DMs. Like, yeah. I know I'm gay. Like, you're so hot. Like, I'm so gay. Like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> what do I do about my boyfriend? And like, it's hard <laughs> because like, I I have, I mean, I'm going to be honest. Like give I was 10 honest. bucks. I'll give you advice. <laughs> right? exactly. It's like, they are paying for a service. Um, I do think I can help, but yeah, it's, it's definitely like therapy. Like I have to kind of say like, listen, this may not be the, uh, the answer you're looking for, but figure out a way to open up your relationship or you're going to have to break up like point blank. Yeah. Yeah. It sucks that you're in this moment of turmoil, but like a lot of queer women have been in this same situation and like, look at me, I'm on the other end of it. Yep. I was a breakup with my ex, but now I have done so many lovely, amazing gay things and like found my identity truly. So yeah, I will have like conversations like that, like daily with people. And it's like, they're at a really pivotal moment in their life. Um, they need someone for support, especially in the pandemic. Like I kind of said, like, it's, they have to pay for like sexting and other things, but if they yeah. want to, I'm there. Um, so I've had a lot of people just like really sad and really like in dark places emotionally. And they just frankly want to be like heard and validated for things that like, they don't want to go to their friends about, they feel yeah. like they have their friends too many times. They're like annoying, um, their friends. And I totally relate to that feeling of being like, am I too much? Yeah. Even though it's transactional, it's like, no, I'm actually going to be there for you. I will respond True. to you. And a lot of the time, I mean, like therapy is transactional, you know, like 
it, and, and no one says anything about that. So I don't have a problem with the fact that it's transactional either, but I think it is really fascinating back to like the vulnerability, like obviously like they, they feel vulnerable enough to, to talk about those things for you. And I also think it's, it's really interesting because like, I feel like, sh- like straight women who, who present as women and assign themselves as women, I feel like they don't get those type of messages in their DMs. Like they're not get like those sex workers aren't getting that kind of stuff. Like they might get that from some men, but like, I feel like it is a more intimate experience. Um, you know, if, you know, if that's a correct assumption, being a queer sex worker, because you're getting people who it, you're, you're showing that intimacy. You're not just showing just the physicality of it. I mean, I, I do know that sex work in general, like people, especially if you have an ongoing client, like they will really tell you all about their deepest fears and stuff like that. But like, yeah, I have a lot of men too, because I am non-binary and I do like both mass and femme looks. Mm -hmm. The majority of the men who are into my page are like bisexual or questioning their sexuality. People say like, oh, you know, the gay agenda, gays are just trying to convert everyone into being gay. And people are like, no, we're not. No, I am. (laughs) I want to make everyone question their sexuality. Um, And yeah, I posted like a video where I like had a strap on and I was like, you know, jacking it. I don't know what Mm -hmm. protocol is for the podcast. Oh, say whatever the fuck you want. It's all good. I was just (laughs) jacking the strap, you know, as one does. And yeah, a guy commented like, I have discovered something new about myself today. <laughs> it feels good to like yeah. open your mind in that way. And then I have, yeah, a lot of men who will come to me like as their femme side, like their femme boy side, uh, which, you know, a lot of people don't get to see. Mm-hmm. And that makes me, I don't know. I feel hopeful for the world. I feel like a lot of people, when they think about like what it's like to have an OnlyFans. They're like, oh, that must suck. You probably have people being like yeah. super rude and creepy in your DMs. Like, yeah. oh, I think most people who like pay to subscribe to an OnlyFans like are very kind and, you know, professional. And it's really not our customers that are the issue. It's it's just other people and how, and the assumptions that they have. Yeah. You know, if you're already at the point where you're like paying for porn, you're probably like, kind of more on the end of like the the woke spectrum yeah that's awesome and I feel like a lot of people I mean I I'm new to that I had no idea you don't think that it's going to be the reverse but I feel like it makes sense because you know you're being conscious and you're paying for your porn right so you're being conscious you're you're paying for some you're paying for a service like you would anything else Mm -hmm. which is just more conscious and better for the industry yeah and they they're already in the process of like discovering their kinks and you know actually integrating their I I don't like porn is part of your sex life and I feel like there's so much shame around it a lot of the time that like some people never even like never even look even if it's or they never they'll be like oh I'm just not it'd be wrong for me to get off to that but it's like no it's it's fantasy you know it'd be wrong for you to go out in the real world maybe and like do some of the things that are you know consensually agreed upon in porn but like to actually give yourself that acceptance of like no this part of me is okay like everyone has sexuality it's a huge part of human existence it's literally how people exist yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. process. um and everybody deserves pleasure I think pleasure is like really a divine thing because mm-hmm. you're like like an orgasm is literally like, you're like transcending reality in that moment. You're literally like, I am just feeling the best feeling in the world. Yeah. And there's nothing that should ever be shamed about that. Like Mm -hmm. patriarchy and like Christianity and like, no, you're not allowed to be happy. You're you're, you're a sinner. You're always a sinner. And it's like, no, we're only here for a little bit of time. We might as well make the best of it. As long as we aren't hurting anybody. Yeah. They put us in these bodies for a fucking reason and we're not allowed, we're not allowed to, to use what we, what we can, you know? Just saying, yeah, if pregnancy is God's will, like, so is fully having butt orgasm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but again, yeah, no, that's just a Republican talking point. Fully, oh fully, fully pro-choice over here. Oh yeah. I, and I, I saw some of your stuff too, because I too have Republican family. Everybody. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it is, it's a lot of fun. I um, was, 
um, hanging out and we'll do Sunday dinners and I don't go to everyone. I'll go to like a couple cause like boundaries. And I went home because my sister was like, are you coming tonight? You haven't been there like the last couple of times. And I was like, yeah, my parents live like 40 minutes away. So I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. I'll come. And, and, um, I was talking to my dad and, and he, I was like, oh my God, like my hair, like, like my hair on my legs is longer than yours. And he was like, come on, Bree. Like, I thought that was just like a summer thing. And I was like, it's an everyday thing. I was like, what am I supposed to shave? And he's like, well, yeah. And I was like, well, do you want to shave? And he's like, well, no. I was like, why? Why do you want to shave? He's like, because I'm a guy. And I was like, okay, well, I don't want to shave because I'm a girl. And he's like, well, they don't do that. I was like, who? (laughs) It's the same thing with my family. It's like, they have just, never question the things that they've heard that yeah, are yeah. That they have to always do and I was just born into this world like ah, I don't what what even is that what is etiquette what is manners like my yeah. personal my joker origin story is that uh my uncle Matt who I love um is like amazing at burping and when I was growing up he would like do these huge burps which were like you know, my dad would just be like, oh, like, hell yeah, bro. Like nice burp or whatever. Yeah. You know? And then I did it. I would do a huge burp and suddenly it's unladylike. Oh. And it's like, and I got in this huge fight with my dad. He's just like, you wouldn't do that around your grandma. I'm like, Matt does it around grandma. And he's like, well, that's a guy. And I'm just like, but like, fuck? why does it matter? And he's like, it just does. And I'm just like, no, it only matters because you're saying it matters. And we're allowed to change the rules at any moment. Yeah. Like being queer is just being a little maverick. They've just never had to question anything because they fit so perfectly into heteronormativity and performing heteronormative behaviors. And so like when I do it, I do it because it's fun because I like to see the puzzled look on their face. And then I ultimately know it's not going to do anything because usually it's like, oh, like, come on, Brie, you're going to take it to another level like that. Or like, oh, like I didn't mean it that way. And oh, we're going to go down the road. Like they usually like try to like minimize it when I get to a point of like being right. And I think it's like they bait you. They always it's like they bait you. They start the conversation. And then once you start making points, it's like, whoa, why do we have to do this? And it's like I'm like, you said you you started it yeah I mean I have a lot of theories I've spent like my whole life just like trying to analyze like why these people are this way and I honestly truly once it clicked for me that like like they're just so repressed like I don't think there are more gay people now I just think there are more people who are accepting enough and brave enough to come to terms with that part of themselves and so I think like when you spent your whole life unconsciously running from the possibility that like you're more feminine of a man than you ever realized or you may you know you may be a little bit gay like like, we're all yeah a little bit okay so for the amount of boomers who are still fully like never even went down yeah they don't want to go down this road well I want them to go down their road like please there's the skeletons in your closet and then maybe you won't be so reactive yeah. and have so much to say about like tiny things about me that don't quite fit in the yeah. gender or sexuality binary. Oh yeah. So. Yeah. I think it's like, and I think queer people in general are more woke just because we have to be, we have to deal with these, these, um, you know, thoughts that we've been repressing that aren't typical or normal, which they are typical and normal, just, you know, less so than, than heteronormative stuff. And you have to deal with all this shit at a young age, a lot of the times, or when you're older and you already have all of these, you know, like beliefs and values, and then you have those conflict against this. There's just so much shit that goes on. Like you can't, I, I, it's really hard to be a queer person and not have trauma. Like, unless you just had like, just super progressive liberal parents. Maybe they were gay. Maybe they weren't. Maybe you live in California. You know what I mean? Maybe you like had your parents had access to therapy and they were able and willing to go. Like there's just like so many factors that go into it, you know, or you live on a fucking commune and you just like have no problems. It's already so hard as a queer person to accept yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, It takes years and years. Like you had a TikTok that was like, you thought everything was going to be better once you came, came out of the closet. And then yeah. it was the one from Step Brothers, And then it was like, mm. in terms of like, yes. I didn't yes. die. I just lowered my heart rate. That yeah. Made me yes. like, like there's always new things that you have to say about yourself. 
And then on top of that, your family is constantly questioning and like asking you to validate yourself and explain yourself. Yeah. Like, I don't, my big, my family, because I, for so long, I was so good at playing the game. Like I very much, since I was a child, they were just like, Summer's a pretty princess. Summer's a pretty princess. And she's going to be our famous little pretty princess and yeah. you know, be like, your hair is so beautiful. Never cut it. Here are these dresses are beautiful. Like, I was like a little doll. I realized that early on. And I started to like beat myself up for my masculinity. And I, I made myself fit in yeah. so well so well like I'm pictures of me in high school I'm like oh my god who is that (laughs) like it made my family think that was the real me and only now that I'm discovering myself and realizing who I am and like that's obviously resulted in me changing a lot about you know how I dress how I how I how I interact with people um and so they think this new me is like a phase and not real. And I'm like, no, <laughs> like it's literally yeah. opposite. Um, but I think that happens with a lot of queer people. It's definitely super traumatic to have to be like policing yourself so much in oh, like, yeah. I feel like I lived a double life and I, I was just performing yeah. all the time. And yeah, that performing everything. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like that's how let's, I feel like this is, this is like a crazy comparison. I just thought of this, like, it's kind of an aha moment. So I was on like a documentary TikTok and I was watching like, um, psychopath interviews and shit like that. And they talk about how they perform, right. They're performing emotions, they're performing and they're watching other people to try and like be like them. So they don't look so fucking crazy and scary and like Uh reptilian, And I was watching something where they had talked about like this, you know, it should be super simple for, you know, a person to say like, what is love? Can you, you know, point it, you know, give some example for love. And like, you know, the psychopath was like kind of silent for like five seconds before he like answered. And it's like, well, you shouldn't have to have five seconds and all of that. But it's funny because it's like queer people learned how to perform like straight people. And, and that's the closest, I feel like queer people are the closest to know what it's like to be a psychopath because we had to, conf- like, we had to perform to be like, no- quote unquote, normal. Ways I have been like, am I crazy? Like, did I just like, I can see how from the outside, it may have looked like I just snapped. There's so yeah. much with like shaving your head. <laughs> There's always like, what happened to her? Yeah. yeah I, I feel like in high school, Like I had so many straight friends and like all of my friends that were girls, like, I mean, now I think of like one or two, but for the most part, like the girls I was friends with in high school are still like very straight. Yeah. I feel like just like you did a good job performing straight then. (laughs) I would mimic their mannerisms and like, especially their style, their outfit. I feel like I got called out for it. Like once, like my friend was just like, I mean she was just like you have bad style and now that I'm queer I'm like I love my style I think yeah. I have like best styles but it's because like the the real style that I needed to be doing was so massively different but yeah very happy it's such a weird thing when like you get more distant from your family at the same time as you get closer to yourself I think it's like so interesting too. like growing up, like I just thought it was like a self-esteem thing because, you know, when you're in middle school, like everyone's self-conscious and worried about what other people think and stuff like that. And that's like a general thing. But I think queer people on top of that not only have that, which is just normal part of growing up in adolescence and stuff like that, but it's also just you're like, oh, I have to like have this boyfriend because like my friends have boyfriends and they're kissing boys and I like I have to do that too to like fit in. And, and like, I remember like liking those kind of things because it kind of felt like a challenge and I was not a challenge, but like a a status symbol. You know what I mean? Like, oh yeah, like I kissed, like I made out with this guy. Like, I didn't even know who he was. Like my first makeout was a random fucking dude that I literally like was at my friend's house. We snuck out of her parents' basement and my friends were like, oh my God, are you going to do it? I was like, yeah, I'm going to make out with him on a fucking swing. And I literally, they were in the bushes and I was making out with this guy, ugly as fuck too, terrible. It was awful. And I straddled him on the swing. This was like eighth grade and made out with him for performing for my friends who were like, oh my God. 
yeah. And I was like, yeah, really? just another day. That's so funny. Yeah. My first makeout was definitely forced, uh, not like in a rapey way and more like a, uh, like my friend was like, Summer, if you don't make out with him right now, I swear to God. And I was just like, okay, yeah, like, I'm going to do it. Hey, yeah, <laughs> like, of course. It's on my <laughs> list of things to do. Okay. Yeah, I'm totally. I mean, I don't know. I have struggled because I am one of those. I like, I am attracted to men in such specific contexts of which I fully don't know like what, why anytime I'm attracted to a man it's like whoa I actually am attracted to this person yeah. sense, and it can be very fleeting so there were like there were definitely times where I was like into it so I think those times made it harder for me to like explore my sexuality until later in life because I was like no I'm good like I like guys yeah, yeah. yeah. even though I'm like horrible and I've broken up with literally all of them and I'm like a serial dater and it's literally like doesn't mean anything to me like yeah no this is fine um of course the first time I was like in a, a queer relationship it's like wait yeah. I have to deal with all these feelings so yeah but yeah first make out um after a navy game I'm from Annapolis Maryland okay. so okay. so we were at a navy game walking in the woods back to her up, back to her house there are two guys with us and she's just like you need to make out with him right now you need to do it and I was so just like peer pressure yeah, I was just like okay yeah right in front of you sure sure um you terrify me and excite me at the same time <laughs> <laughs> probably had more of a crush on her for being a toxic woman than than the guy but yeah I made out with him it was just like we did it got it over with <laughs> In retrospect, a lot of my friendships growing up, I was just like deeply in love with them. <laughs> and that's why like everything was such a big deal. Like I yeah. feel like the I- Friendship breakup probably felt like the end of the world. Definitely. Really a lot of suppressed love. There's even like some friends who I'm like, I will reach out to them. <laughs> like, yeah. like apologize and say like, sorry, I just, I was actually in love with you. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm gay gay and didn't know it and so my emotions probably made no sense at all and that's that but yeah you're allowed to be everyone's a mess 100 percent. you're definitely allowed to be a mess that's why also I think I love queer people because yeah like you were saying when somebody has mental health advocate you just automatically like them it's like Mm -hmm. queer people are wearing their problems on their sleeve like they're not like oh, I'm, I'm perfect. I'm so like, everybody you meet is just like a dumpster fire versus a lot of the straight people that we just like grew up with. You, you got, you got a little bit of Scorp in you. I feel like you got some Scorpio in you. I actually, uh, yeah, no, I, I don't have Scorpio. No. I have a little, but I'm mainly, I mean, the room, I'm a Virgo. (laughs) Okay. I'm a Virgo sun, Leo moon, which I have found that so many sex workers are Leo moons. It's so funny. I, was, I <laughs> honestly was thinking Leo or Aquarius for like your sun sign. And I was like, she's not a Scorpio, but she might have some in her. Cause you were like, I have to process everything. And I was like, that's fucking me. I got to process it all. Are you Scorpio? I am a Libra, but I have a Scorpio moon. And then I have like Scorpio and like four other placements. <laughs> nice. Wow. Yeah. I have a Virgo stellium. So I'm very Virgo. I think Virgo honestly is a lot of processing that people don't think about because we're just so analytical. So it's like, I'm, I'm very emotional. Leo, like so drama. And then, and then my Virgo son is like, I need to analyze exactly why I'm having all these emotions. And then I'm a Sagittarius rising. So Uh, that's why I've moved a bunch of times. This is my uh, third city in (laughs) maybe four years. Um, So yeah, I'm in Denver now. Denver's a shit. Have you ever been to their vampire ball? Like no, the- I moved here in the pandemic. So there's like so many things I haven't done. Holy I've been, shit. In I've been, I've made some queer community, I think, but I haven't been able to go to a gay bar. Like the whole oh. time I've lived in the pandemic. Before that, I lived in New York City. So that's where I really like, you know, yeah. got out of the hometown, like started being gay, there you go. shaved my head, you know. But in the end, yeah, I- I, I visited here and I was just like, I love it there. 
and I just like moved yeah. on. So. Denver's the shit, but like I went, I was there for just a random vacation. I was at a hostel and they were doing like a intro for this vampire ball. So it's this entire like underground subculture and it's like cosplay mixed with, it's like cosplay with kink and Halloween. Like that's like the, the vibe. And I'm like, okay, I would like, you would love it. I like stumbled upon it that. and everyone was in costume. So like, you know, you had like, Docubus, Succubus, Incubus. Um, there was like someone dressed up as Captain Hook. You just had a lot of like, uh, there was like five Mary Antoinettes at the Vampire Ball. Like just like five, like five of them. Like five I, Marie Antoinettes. I'm obsessed right and I wish I had more money, but <laughs> don't we all? But I <laughs> want to be able to afford like, like men's clothes from like the 18th century. Yeah. Like I love the look. I love like, old prince outfits like I want like you know fucking coat or cloak yeah. with like ruffles and like the thing like yeah, I just yeah. like, it's so hot um and also but it's like very expensive oh I've been watching Dickinson which is Emily Dickinson's life it's on Apple TV and it's like Great that. Gatsby where like it's like new mixed with old and it's so fucking amazing like it has some great actors in it but like I love 19th century like menswear and um early like 20th century like the 1920s I'm obsessed I live in a 1918 style house like I'm obsessed with it and and um watching it I was like they have like the cravats which I think are like fucking cool it's like the they're called cravats but like they're kind of like scarves and I was like that and just with the the vest and the pocket watch. I'm obsessed with pocket watches. Dude, with my pocket watch and my cigar. That's the vibe, honestly. Yeah. yeah. I I think after the pandemic, since we've all I love I love comfy. Like comfy is important to me. I hope that we all just dress to the nines like whenever. Why not? We literally spent over a year inside. If somebody doesn't throw a Roaring's 20s party, I'm going to be fucking pissed cuz I have my outfit. I literally went to a Roaring Twenties uh, New Year's Eve party right before all this. Amazing. It was hot. And then literally two months later, well, not Roaring, not not very Roaring Twenties. Yeah. More like a Spanish influenza right yeah. before the Twenties. <laughs> that we will have a Roaring Twenties after the Spanish influenza. They say that we will. They say that it'll be similar to that. Like it'll, like it'll usher in like, that and I mean I guess I'm like I don't know if I get to a generation because I'm 26 but like people who are young, still young that had to deal with something like that and they're coming out of it questioning everything you know and and so many people have come out as gay like I think everyone has like started to realize because they've had time to like think and to not be a part of capitalism and and anything any other oppressive things and they're like sitting with their thoughts like what do I want to do with my life who am I and that's why the Roaring Twenties happened, I think, because of because of war and shit like that. People had to be confronted with their demons. I personally, and I keep being like, it's such a weird period of time because I feel like so much time has passed and so little has passed. Yeah. Like I came out as non-binary and I'm like, Summer, that's a huge deal. Like, how did you forget that that happened? <laughs> it's just been so dramatic that even like these major things that have happened in our own lives, it's easy to just be like, oh, that's how it's always been. But it's like, there's, yes, everybody is like completely different than they were when we went into this thing. A lot of processing. I think everybody had like at least like five personal tests of like their sanity. Oh, 100%. Actually like confront our emotions and how we deal with conflict. And like all of my relationships got completely like, okay, what's working, what's toxic. So yeah, everyone rolling out of this pandemic, a brand new bitch. Hell fucking yeah. I feel like so interesting because I I was out of like a serious relationship um, maybe a month before COVID hit. And I feel like if we hadn't done that, it we would have stayed. Like it would have been something that would have been like bond, like we would have, like, I don't think we would have broken up until it like got to the end. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. I feel like if it didn't happen then, it would have would have been put off because that's such a big deal and like now you have each other you know and stuff like that and like and so I'm kind of glad I am glad that like 
you know, the decision was made at the time because I feel like it would have just dragged on. And like, I did so much shit. I had a fucking whole phase. It was a fucking glorious. And, and I wouldn't have had that before. So I had a, um, like a two week U-Haul at the beginning of the pandemic because I thought the world was ending and yeah. Just yeah. Started getting, it was very much like, oh, it's now or never. It's now or never. Let's quarantine together. And that ended up being like, so stupid of me. Like I literally did not know this person. We just fully like trauma bonded U-Haul. Yep did the thing. And then it was so intense, that relationship. It was so, one of those, I feel like this happens to queer people all the time. We're like, you yes, have a yeah. relationship where like, it's literally such a small amount of time that you're together, but it like is so catastrophic yeah. when it explodes. Um, oh, yeah. So that relationship was the very beginning of the pandemic did not last long and then spurred like the healing process I've been going through for the entire pandemic because I like got a new therapist with this therapist, I told her about this. She was like, what's the longest time you've ever been single? I was like, um, next question. <laughs> maybe like, how old was I in sixth grade? Maybe like 11 years. <laughs> uh, like it's been kind of nonstop since then. Right. And so she was like, okay, I don't want you to date for like at least a year. And I was kind of like, <laughs> okay, I'm going to have secrets. From like, this like not like, like FaceTime dates or like, like first no, dates no. or like, like actual dating, can we still fuck on the first date? Like, what are the parameters? Exactly. But at first I was like, okay, I'm not going to do that. But then as I started to go along, I was like, wait, I think this is actually the perfect time for me to do this because first of all, online dating is really bad yes, <laughs> and really yes. difficult, sucks. Um, and I've never done it. And when people like, I wasn't recovering from a substance, but I was still like, you know, getting to know what it meant to have BPD and in yeah. recovery, and when you go into recovery for uh, substance abuse like you're not allowed to date for a year because you're, you're right. still that here and so I was like you know what like I'm gonna do it and luckily like I'm not a saint like my job is making porn so like yeah, I yeah, yeah. have some sex <laughs> like I had lots yeah, of sex yeah. but it was like very much each each of my collabs is like in a container of like, this isn't only fans collab. That allowed me to just like really get to know myself. And I feel like before this, I was like in back to back failed fucking phases. Yeah. <laughs> situation ship, situation ship, situation ship. Mm-hmm. I didn't know why they weren't working because I was so gay and like it was scary and I didn't know how to communicate and needed to sort out my attachment styles. So I feel Ooh, like attachment styles. I can go on and on about that shit. Yeah, I am the very coveted no I'm the worst one which is the rarest one which is fearful disorganized the- avoidant. yeah so I'm both anxious and avoidant oh, shit. um it's not fun but it's something that you definitely I think more people are this way than they realize I was like very like oh I'm just anxious when I first learned about attachment styles and I had to accept that like no it's summer like you have been very avoidant in a lot of ways and you need to accept that. So yeah, I've been working on that. And I feel like when I, when, when things finally open up again, I'm going to be like just reaching that one year mark. And now I'm like fully ready to date in a way that is actually healthy. And yeah, I think the queer world needs more, needs more healthy relationships. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. (laughs) And just like the the representation, right, needs to be yeah. like healthy too. Like we don't just like yeah, like queer coming outs it, or have a place, but like can we see some happy motherfuckers? You yeah. know what I mean? Like it would be nice. It would be nice. I think any time there is like any queer representation of a relationship, like not in movies, in like you know the the micro celebrity sphere of yeah. queer influencers it's like people are like oh my god like I love it and 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 they just they want it to work so bad that yeah. like if it doesn't actually work it's like it fucks up everybody and people pick sides and it can be messy and like it just goes to show that it's just because we're like so starved for yeah. a story that works and that, and that stuff can- matters like yeah. it matters more to a queer person and like because they see themselves in that person and it's like if, well if, it's almost like if you're parent if you're a parent you know or if you're a child of like divorce you're like well you know they couldn't do it so I can't do it you know what I mean I'm just like not wired for it so like I feel like queer people see that and they're like 
they see the representation and then they're like, oh my God, they broke up. Like there's no hope for any of us <laughs> if they it's can't. Like, no, that's not true. Those people were just a little too traumatized and everybody, especially because we were like denied these relationships for all of our Mm-hmm. growing up and being in compulsory heterosexuality like I feel like as soon as we realize it about ourselves we are just like we just want to jump in and that's yeah, why yeah. you you hauling happens and you hauling is actually like extremely toxic and red flag behavior but it's oh, like yeah. a hallmark of the lesbian and sapphic communities and it's like let's examine that because yeah. we should not, ju- we shouldn't be jumping in like this. Mm-mm. That shows like a desperation for love as opposed yes, to yes. like having love because you have space for it and you're willing to share now True. and not just being codependent. So Ooh, codependency hits, hits hard in the queer community. If you, if you haven't had a codependent relationship, I mean, I don't know if we can be friends because that's just <laughs> a pillar. If your first rela- serious relationship, you weren't codependent, you didn't trauma bond, you didn't just enmesh into someone else to where you forgot who you were, then mm, I, don't, I don't know. You haven't had at least three extremely codependent friendships where you literally have to ask this person, is this cute? Is this okay? Before you do literally anything, we aren't going to relate. I used to do that all the time, but I am a Libra, so I can't be a bit indecisive. And I'm like, but does this sound like a better message to my boss? Or does this sound like a better message to my boss? Like, what am I trying to convey here? And she's like, I don't just like fucking pick. Like what, 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 why do I need? I was like, but I want your opinion because I love you and you're, mm-hmm. you're I want it. And she's like, just pick a fucking thing. And I'm like, well, here are my options. I, I relate. I, I like to tell people that means that I solve my problems by being hot. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, I don't know how to deal with this. So I'm just going to look cute and hope that it, the decisions get made for me. Yeah, um, I know. So this will be our question with the queer segment, guys, um, where we try to answer your questions on life, love, happiness that we have no business trying to answer, but we're going to do it anyways. Uh, this question comes from Anonymous, and they ask, was it harder coming out as queer? Was it harder coming out as non-binary? Or was it harder coming out as a sex worker? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Good question. Great questions. So coming out as queer... I'm so I'm weird in that my family has always been very conservative and I've just always kind of like by default kept secrets from them. So as soon as I knew that I was queer, like when I was first in a freshman in college, I was like, I think I'm bi. I just kind of like tweeted that shit. I was like, yo, I'm bi. So I like came out online far before I ever came out to my family. Um, I was very out and very gay online for a very long time before I actually came out to my family, I ended up just group chatting everyone. (laughs) And just, by the way, uh, just want to like, you know, get this on the table so so it can be a a thing and I don't really want to talk about it that much, but like, I am gay, I will have a wife and I can't wait. Like, have a great (laughs) rest. And I can't wait. See you guys later at high noon tea. Okay. Uh, So that, so being queer was the easiest one because that's the only one I've actually like talked to my family about. Um, being non-binary was something I discovered about myself this past summer. I was meditating and yes. in my meditation. I just heard like crystal clear. It was just like, I am a man and a woman. And I was yeah. like, who, said that? <laughs> who, who are you? <laughs> it just kept repeating in my head. And I was like, okay. And I mean, some non-binary people are like, I am neither a man or a woman. Yeah. My- of non-binary is like I'm both bitch like I, I go back and forth sometimes I'm both at the same time um that I I came out I came out on my Instagram which is basically like this, this is my my whole life um but I have not talked to I I came out to my siblings which was not that bad I have not talked to my parents about it or my family because I, I I'm a strong believer that like the onus should not be on the person who who's possibly putting their you know putting their self out there and yeah. it, the onus should not be on the oppressed person to like ask for validation, especially if that process might put them in harm's way. I have like heard a lot of people in my family be transphobic many times. I'm not saying it's a conversation that will never happen, but like, I'm fully cool with just like being myself and living my life and not necessarily like 
having conversations with people who are like determined to misunderstand you because that's boundaries. Yep. Exactly. Being a sex worker is 100% more stigmatized, I believe, than being non-binary or being queer because it's just like a realm that not a lot of visibility has happened with. And like, even like super progressive people who are like all on board with, you know, canceling transphobia and homophobia will, they will be like very phobic against sex workers. I've had like friends, parents find out about it and be like, you can't hang out with her anymore. I was outed for it in a way that like did not happen with my sexuality. It's not like, oh, did you hear this person came out as queer? It's just like, oh my God, do you know what Summer's doing now? You know, and that, I just, yeah, there's a lot more, um, we have a lot further to go, I think, in terms of normalizing and destigmatizing sex work. That's a conversation that like, I never know whether I'm willing to have with someone or not, because I never know what they're going to say. I would say I face the most like day-to-day uh, stress from, from being a sex worker. Crazy. I find that so crazy. Like it, it might affect my, I mean, like I'm trying to distance myself from my last name. It, it's not like, I don't know. I wouldn't, not that it doesn't happen. Like, cause I know there are laws and stuff, but like, like people do get fired for being trans, but like, it's, it's not even a question that people get fired for being a sex worker or oh, yeah. that people will not be able to ever get another job for the rest of their lives. Like people regularly talk about that as if it's the fault of the sex worker and not the fault of the society and something that like requires protection. Yeah. I mean, look, like I come at it from an entrepreneurial standpoint. Like if you're, if you're making fucking money, then like, why are you like, if I was going into sex work, I'd be like, I'm going to make a shit ton of money so that I never have to like deal with having to get a job and having to deal with someone not getting, giving it to me. You know what I mean? Like I'm going to fucking buy the shit that I want to buy. I'm going to retire early, maybe start another business or maybe do something like a passion. Yeah. It's just like, we're okay with capitalizing off of our bodies in so many different ways. Um, like people who do physical labor, that's again, like you're capitalizing off your body. Athletes. You're allowed to cap- Athletes, you're allowed to capitalize off of your intellect. I like to, I mean, I use intellect of course, but it's like, I like to be able to not like fry my brain at work. I don't, I've had jobs where it's like, I'm, a, I'm getting paid as a creative and I'm just being like forced weekly to like pump out new ad campaigns. And like, that yeah. just was not for me. Like, I like to talk to people. <laughs> I like to spread joy and pleasure. And again, it's like, if I was a cop or if I was in the military, those are acceptable ways to be paid to kill people. And yep. like, I am paid to give orgasms. Yep. Very yep. different. It's nuts. <laughs> Yeah, there's no violence in it. No one's getting hurt. So what's the big deal? It's just because people are terrified of sex. Oh, yeah. But they're so accustomed to violence. Mm -hmm. So like that is it's it's so acceptable to to have that because our whole fucking like our whole country has been built on violence. Yeah, we got the country by violence. Literally, I are probably going to go out with violence, you know, right? how much better would this country be if it was built on sex work and built on being hot and nice? I will say part of the West when they, you know, had the frontiers and all that shit was with sex work um, because it was um, all of the, the, the guys that were going to work in the wild, wild West or whatever. The women were the ones that were the sex workers and they had the money. That's sick. I would love if you look into it, it's fucking dope because they were the they they were some of the truest entrepreneurs, um, at least when they were like pioneering the frontier and stuff like that, because like the guys would work all day long and they would go and to the saloons or whatever. And and, you know, they ran away with all the cash that they were doing with mining the railroads or whatever the fuck they were doing out there. But that's awesome. I I do wish there were like. I think there should be brothels. I think that sex workers should be able to have, yeah, they should be able to have like workplaces where they can be together and have safety, you know, as opposed to like just doing everything undercover, even like online, it's like, 
it's starting to get very difficult. Like when I first made my OnlyFans, mm-hmm. it was like pop in and I never had to worry about it. Now it's like, I can't post anything on Instagram, even like fully, like I'm not pushing the envelope. Like I'm clothed in this. They will still report. Like all my pictures get reported immediately. Wow. Yeah. So it's like, it's difficult. Not going to lie. Like, I think there has been a lot of glamorization of sex work in terms of like, oh, we're just making so much money. And like, it is a really nice way to make money because it doesn't take as much time, but like, you're always like looking over your shoulder. Like, am I going to get deleted? Am I going to get deleted tomorrow? Like everybody has a backup account. And if you get deleted, then it's like, okay, that's my whole source of income. Yeah the whole thing I've become, I've come to rely on. So it's really terrifying to have your life in the hands of Mark Zuckerberg, especially when you get paid to be hot full time. And he gets paid to look like a fucking psycho. He gets paid to drink water incorrectly. (laughs) Ew. He looked like a normal human being. And now he looks like the fucking lizard king. I truly believe he is reptilian. I think they all are. Mitch McConnell, like he's a turtle. But he's a turtle. Okay, amphibian. He's a crustacean. I, I think of him as like Mr. Krabs. He's fucking yeah, Mr. Krabs. That's very true. Yeah. Jeff Bezos, very gecko-y, very lizard man. Yeah. All of them. And it's just because like, they are incels. They are just incels with a lot of power. So they see like women primarily actually getting in charge of their money and getting in their bag and making profit off of something that like everybody needs like not everybody can just get off in their head or like being a hot book you know like for people to have orgasms which are very good for people's health there's so many reasons why it's like important to pleasure yourself all right summer do you want to answer some questions really quick yeah you do let's go apple or spotify uh Spotify. Chocolate or vanilla? Vanilla. Hot take. Oh, hot take. Truth or dare? Truth always. I'm such a Virgo. <laughs> I can't do the dare. Like, don't make me dare, please. <laughs> okay. So you've seen the L work because we talked about it. Um, if you had to save one character, would you save Tina or Jenny? Jenny. Ah, why? Why, why, why? <laughs> I don't know. Something about crazy girls. I'm just like, I love yeah. you. <laughs> Please marry me. Yeah, no, Tina's I mean, boring. Yeah, Tina is boring. boring. She's Jenny just boring. Like, tortured artist. Tortured artist. Deep down. Mm-hmm. Um, do you tie your drawstring hoodies? Yes or no? Uh, no. I just go like shh. straight up. Cake or cookies? Cookies. Jean jackets or flannels? flannels Ooh-hoo. giving presents or getting presents can i choose both yeah <laughs> <laughs> they're both really good they really are <laughs> it is um last question um favorite queer movie of all time i don't know maybe like rocky horror picture show <laughs> okay okay i just uh i mean definitely some problematic bits in that but like i love a good camp I do. I love, I mean, I was a theater gay yeah. in high school. So I just like, I just think it's a perfect and it's very gay and nice. There you go. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for being on this podcast summer. If you want to check out more about summer, you can find them at XXX summer breeze. And as always, you can find me on all platforms at Brie Logan. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please subscribe where you are listening or viewing and check out our full video episodes on YouTube with the link below. That's it for this episode. My queers, be you, be queer, stay safe, and we will see you on the next episode.